Good afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I'm Jessica Philippe. I'm the Member Engagement Librarian at the South Central Regional Library Council, and I would like to introduce the presenter for today's webinar, Julia Carice. She is the Digital Services Librarian here at SCRLC. So, hi, Julia. Hi. <laughs> So, as Jessica mentioned, my name is Julia Kreese. I'm the Digital Services Librarian here at SCRLC. If you're not familiar with SCRLC, we are one of nine regional multi-type resource councils in New York State. And together with the other eight councils, we make up ESLN, which is the Empire State Library Network. Through our combined efforts, we are able to offer several statewide services to our members, including New York Heritage and New York State Historic Newspapers, which I'll be talking about um, in detail today, as well as some others, um, such as the Empire Archival Discovery Cooperative, which is a statewide repository for finding aids, Ask Us 24-7, which is an online chat service, um, Empire Library Delivery, which is a uh, delivery service for academic libraries, and many continuing education opportunities. Uh, ESLN also sponsors the Empire State Digital Network, which is New York State's service hub to the Digital Public Library of America. You can find more about the services we offer through ESLN at ESLN.org, if you're interested. So SCRLC serves approximately 70 members across 10,000 square miles in uh, many counties. Our members are comprised of academic, hospital, corporate, and nonprofit libraries, public library systems, school library systems, individual public libraries, and historical organizations. Today we're going to take a broad look at what steps are involved in starting a digitization program or project at your organization. So in today's webinar, we'll discuss why starting a digitization program is important for smaller organizations, what steps are involved in starting a digitization project, including project planning, equipment, and metadata description, how you can host your digitized content in New York Heritage Digital Collections, the Digital Public Library of America, and New York State Historic Newspapers, and what services are available through SCRLC to get you started digitizing your collections for little or no cost. So today you're probably here because you have considered creating a digital collection, but you may be asking yourself the following questions. Where do I begin? Is it even worth the time and effort? How do I convince my board of trustees, administrators, or coworkers that digitization is important? And can we even afford to digitize? What about the cost of equipment and staffing? But the big question that encompasses all of these is how do you get buy-in? How do you get other people to understand the value and let you have the resources you need to digitize? To answer these questions, we need to understand what it means to digitize something. The technical definition of digitization is the conversion of text, pictures, or sound into a digital form that can be processed by a computer. However, digitization is more than just scanning. It's a process, and each step is different and necessary. This process includes the selection of materials, cataloging and creating descriptive metadata, creating digital copies of materials through scanning or photography, and sharing the materials online for educational, educational and personal use. So now that we understand this process, let's talk about some reasons why it's important to digitize and share your collections online. One reason why it's important to digitize is to make your collections accessible and discoverable. When you contribute to the local, state, regional, and national historical record about people, places, and events, you're adding value to your collections when they can be searched and retrieved alongside other historical and cultural collections. You also open up your collections to a whole new audience by improving accessibility to special collections. And that includes those who might not be physically able to visit your library or organization. Optical character recognition, or OCR for short, and transcriptions of materials not only allow for better use and retrieval of items, but it also allows the visually impaired access to items through text-to-voice software. It also increases the use of your collection exponentially, since people from anywhere in the country can access your collections and they don't have to physically visit the items. You also increase the visibility and online presence of your library and organization. 
You can connect collections to groups of people you never thought would be interested. Who is interested in the photograph collection you might have of gravestones or covered bridges or one-room schoolhouses? There are national interest groups that might not be sustainable on a local level, but the Internet allows them to come together to share their interests, leading to much greater use of your niche materials. You never know who will be interested in your content until you put it out there. Digitization can also help preserve valuable items in your collections. Smaller libraries and historical organizations often hide special items or store them in locations that deter use out of fear that the items will be damaged or stolen, and these are valid concerns. Digitization allows the ability to share rare, fragile items with a broad audience without the white gloves and extra security measures. Digital formats aren't necessarily more long-term than physical ones, and we'll talk a little bit about digital preservation and storage later on, but they do serve as a backup. Here's an example of why a digital copy can be better for users and for preserving the originals. One public library has a series of books on architecture in their community. The series was created by a local author, and they are no longer in print. The books have been used annually in a middle school project and are beginning to show the wear and tear. In an effort to protect the books from further damage while still making the books accessible to a large number of students, they were digitized and made available on the Internet. As part of the digitization process, the materials were OCR'd, and the new functionality allowed teachers and students to search within the text of the book series. Not only were the originals preserved, but students and teachers gained an added benefit from the digitization. Establishing partnerships with local community members and organizations can also help you reach your digitization goals. Partnerships with clubs, community organizations, and government agencies can lead to better resources. For example, a public library can partner with the local museum, historical society, churches, or local clubs to share resources. These resources may include knowledge, staff time, volunteers, computer equipment, and money for projects. Let's use this photograph as an example as to how partners can assist you in the digitization process. To many of us, this image may be just a train at a station. A train enthusiast, on the other hand, might be able to tell you the exact type of train in this image, how long this type of train was in use, and maybe could even tell you where it typically traveled. This kind of knowledge is needed when cataloging and adds context to your image. By involving the train enthusiast as a community partner, you're also engaging with your local community and generating interest in the material you're digitizing. We also strongly encourage partnerships among our members at SCRLC. One project we're currently working on with a grant from Humanities New York is an online exhibition celebrating the women's suffrage centennial in New York State this fall. The exhibition will feature digitized content from SCRLC members and organizations from around the state, and a traveling version of the exhibition will be available for our members to host. But most importantly, your content is just one piece of a much larger whole. The stories told by your content can multiply when it appears with content from multiple institutions. Including your content in the online historical record helps complete the stories that can be told through our shared cultural heritage. For example, in 2016, the Empire State Library Network sponsored an essay writing contest which encouraged original research around cultural, social, and political topics of New York State history, utilizing the digital collections developed by the Empire State Library Network, um, New York State Historic Newspapers, and New York Heritage Digital Collections. The winning essay, written by Kelly Huggins from Chemung County Historical Society, drew a link between the expressions and anxiety about human adoption um, and what some 19th century citizens were observing in animals. Ms. Huggins also talked about the morality of animals, illustrated kindness, and care in their human counterparts. To the left is a photograph from a series belonging to the Great Neck Library local history collection, picturing a hen co-mothering a group of American Pit Bull Terrier puppies. This photograph shows the canine mother nursing the puppies while the hen is sitting calmly next to her. Very calmly, I might add. 
The center image is a bedtime story from 1910, published in the Union Gazette from Newark, New York, where a cat overhears that her owners are planning to drown her kittens, so she carries them to a hen's nest in a shed, where the hen and cat co-mothered the kittens until they were grown, and when the owners saw the playful grown kittens, they were unable to drown them anymore. To the right is an image from the New York Historical Society, also from 1910, depicting a cat named Reddy who adopted two guinea pigs. These are wonderful individual pieces from each collection, but it was allowing them to be searched together in New York Heritage and New York State Historic Newspapers that made Ms. Huggins' research possible. So now that we've discussed why it's important to digitize and hopefully given you some good talking points for buy-in at your organizations, let's talk about how you can get started with your project. Some things you'll need to consider throughout the planning process are things like, where will the content live? Who will host it? And will I need to purchase storage space? If you're partnering with SCRLC to host your content through New York Heritage or New York State Historic Newspapers, you'll still need to store the original files at your library organization. So that is a concern. How will the items be digitized? Will you digitize items in-house or will you outsource your digitiz digitization? Digitizing items in-house means you will use staffing and equipment at your organization to digitize the collection. Some concerns with in-house digitization are who will do the conversion from the physical object to the digital object. Will it be staff, volunteers, or interns? What equipment is needed? Do you have a scanner and a computer that will suit your needs? Will purchasing new equipment be necessary? Where will the conversion be done? Do you have a secure and com comfortable place to work? Outsourcing your digitization means that you'll be hiring a vendor to digitize the materials for you, either on or off-site. Some outsourcing concerns are, where will the funding come from? Depending on the material size and condition, digitization projects can add up when you outsource. You'll want to obtain quotes from various vendors and see if an outsource project is viable. Having a vendor come to your location to digitize can be very expensive, so you'll also want to consider whether or not you're willing to ship items off-site. Sometimes, an organization may choose to do both, depending on the project. For example, a library might own a flatbed scanner that they use to digitize photographs and letters in-house, but don't have the equipment necessary to digitize rolls of microfilm or large print newspapers. Therefore, they may choose to secure funding to outsource the microfilm and print newspapers, but move forward with the scanning of the photographs and letters in-house. And most importantly, you'll need to consider what items from your collection you plan on digitizing. There are many different criteria you might use to select items for digitization. Some potential criteria you can use are, is the item original and unique? Has it been digitized already by another organization? Is the physical item difficult to use or handle because of size? Or is the format unstable and deteriorating, such as sound or videotapes or printed materials on acidic paper? Is the original copy in good enough condition to be digitized? And is it a true original? While we prefer to digitize copies of things for some unstable formats, such as microfilm copies of deteriorating newspapers, most of the time we don't want to digitize facsimiles of things and prefer original materials. Is the subject something you know is of interest to the community or a potential partner organization? Have the items been described or cataloged anywhere? If not, you'll want to consider that creating the descriptive metadata will take up a larger part of your staff time on the project than the actual digital conversion. And finally, have you researched the copyright status? You don't want to spend time digitizing hundreds of items only to find out that you don't have the right to put them up online. So let's discuss copyright in a bit more detail. One thing that's important to know is that ownership of an item does not automatically give you the rights to digitize and put the image up online unless you have a signed transfer of rights agreement with the item's creator or heirs. So it's important to ask yourself some rights questions before you start digitizing, such as, does someone own the rights to the item still or is it in the public domain? Currently, Anything published prior to 1923 or unpublished items prior to 1897 are automatically in the public domain, and you don't need to do any more work in determining who owns the rights. 
But just because an item was published or created after those dates doesn't mean you can't digitize it still and put it up. It just takes a little more work. If you can identify the rights holder, you can ask permission, and most of the time people are eager to grant permission. For example, let's say you have an unpublished diary from a soldier in World War II that was donated by a collector who found it at a yard sale. You're able to discover from Ancestry.com that the author passed away in 1995 and discover the name of a daughter who is still his living heir. You're able to find a mailing address for the daughter online, so you send her a letter asking permission to digitize the diary and host it in your heritage. If the daughter responds and agrees, you can have her sign a rights agreement form giving you permission, and you're all set to go. If she never responds, just make sure you keep documentation of your efforts to contact her, either via phone, post, or email, or all three, and you can still put the item up online. This is called due, due diligence. Since you're putting these items up for educational use, the worst that's going to happen is that a rights holder requests you take the item down in the future, and that happens very rarely. But let's take an example that's a bit more ambiguous. Imagine you have a large collection of postcards from the 1950s to the 1970s, and you're not sure if they're still in copyright or not. Some of them have publisher names on them, some don't. You do a little bit of Googling and discover that pretty much all of the publishers listed on these postcards have gone out of business. Sure, you could spend hours and hours trying to discover who owns or inherited the remains of these businesses, but what are the odds that one of these rights holders, if they even exist, would recognize or request takedowns if they came across your collection? The same thing might apply for a collection of photographs with unknown photographers. A big piece of copyright work will be determining how much copyright research needs to go into a collection based on the risk that there are active rights holders out there. In the case of the World War II diary, it's reasonable that a relative of the author might stumble across the diary while doing their own genealogical research and might not appreciate that no permission was ever sought for publishing the diary online. So you'd want to take more care with that in trying to secure the rights than you would with a postcard or a photo collection with no clear and evident rights holders, even though they may legally exist. And I did push, whoops, I did push a, sorry, moving forward here. There we go. Um, I want to point out the Cornell Public Domain Chart um, at the bottom. I did put a link to that there. This is probably the single most important tool that I use when I'm researching copyright on any collection. Um, so I would highly recommend um, that you bookmark it in your or web browser. Um, just because something is post-1923 doesn't mean that it's necessarily still in copyright. Um, there are a lot of hoops that people have to jump through in order to keep their items in copyright. So if people didn't renew an item by a certain year, their item may still be in the public domain even if it was published in like the 50s through the 70s. So it's great to check out that, that chart, do a little bit of copyright research, and then you may find out um, that most of your items are in the public domain anyway. So now that you've considered how and what you want to digitize, you'll want to start outlining and addressing some organizational questions. These include, what parts of your collection do you want to digitize? What methods and equipment will you use to digitize your collections? Will different collections use different methods? Are there any collections that will be off limits due to rights or usage restrictions? Who in the organization will be responsible for digitization planning? How will you host your collections online? What software will, software will be needed? How will you name your files? Um, how will you create the naming convention? And I'll talk about that um, a little bit further in the presentation. Do you have a digitization budget? If not, how can you create one? How will you store and preserve the archival copies of the digital files? If you have collections management or strategic planning documents for your organization, consider integrating your digitization plan into those documents. It's very important that digitization be seen as an operation vital to your organization, not just as a pet project of a single employee. Digitization is vital to the long-term viability of any organization housing cultural heritage materials, because if you're not providing online access to them, they might as well not exist for the large majority of students, researchers, community members, potential visitors and donors, and other stakeholders. 
So I want to take a quick detour and talk very briefly about digital preservation and storing your digital images. These are decisions that need to be made and prepared for before any digitization projects begin. Otherwise, you may find yourself losing your original files. And if you're willing to put in the effort to digitize, you don't want to have to repeat your work digitizing later on because the original files were lost. So we start with the... What, 3 two, one rule of digital preservation, which means you keep three copies of your images, you make sure two copies are stored in different formats, and one of those copies should be stored off-site. So three copies does not mean three copies of a file in a folder or different folders on your computer. It means having them in three different physical locations. For example, one could be on your computer, one on a portable hard drive, and one in the cloud. In the example I just gave, um, that would also meet the two format rule. Two copies are being stored on hard drives and one copy in the cloud. So the two formats would be disk storage, the computer hard drive and the portable hard drive, and cloud storage. We don't recommend CDs and DVDs for storage. Those can degrade and scratch easily. And keep in mind that external hard drives are not permanent either. The files should be transferred and the drive replaced every five years or so. So in order to uh, make sure, ensure the longevity of your files, you also would need to run fixity checks on your files or subscribe to a service or software that will do it for you. This should be done whenever you transfer files from one place to another. Like for example, if you're transferring files from one portable hard drive for another because it's, it's reached the end of its lifespan. And at regular intervals, which would be at least once a year. When I talk about fixity in this context, it is the property of a digital file or object being fixed or unchanged. Many cloud storage services will also run fixity checks on your files at regular intervals, and this is a good thing to consider when deciding what cloud storage provider you're using. We understand that the digital preservation question is difficult for small organizations without IT staff or organizational funding for storage and backup solutions. SCRLC is also hoping to be able to offer an inexpensive digital preservation service to our members in the future using Archivematica software and Amazon Cloud Storage. This is still in the planning phase, but we're hoping to beta test the service in the coming year. So it's also very important for digital preservation to have a naming convention, um, which I mentioned before, for all your digitized files. Naming conventions are important because they allow you to locate and identify files even when all other metadata may be lost. Each file name should include a unique identifier that allows you to find an item in the collection from the file name. This could be a bibliographic record number or a barcode number. Um, it could be an accession ID or a number assigned to an object within a collection by the cataloger. So after you've addressed your organizational concerns, you'll be ready to start planning for your first project. Here's where you'll want to address more specific details about a group of items you've selected to digitize from your collections. These details will include um, your project objective and time frame. Your objective should be clear, specific, attainable, and measurable. Here, I've used an example that we will digitize, describe, and make accessible in New York Heritage the Anne Brown collection of farmhouse photographs to be completed in six months. You also want to look at what the physical characteristic, characteristics of the collection is. In the example above, the collection includes 231 black and white photographs from 1949 to 1964, varying in size from 4 by 6 inches to 5 by 7 inches. It also includes 17 images in black and white negatives, not included in the 231 printed photographs. Who will work on the project? How many hours a week um, or month will they dedicate? And what tasks will team members be responsible for, including scanning, description, and uploading? In our example, the project will involve a library project manager and three volunteers, with the project manager dedicating five hours a week to processing and describing the images, while two volunteers will each spend two hours a week scanning images until they've been completed. The third volunteer will help identify the locations of the farmhouses depicted in the photographs 
for three hours a week until completed. You can estimate the value of this staff time at X number of dollars for the project manager and Y number of dollars for the volunteers. SCRLC staff will upload the items into New York Heritage. What equipment and software will be used for the project? Will you need training? So back to our example, the library will purchase an 8.5 by 11 photograph and document scanner for this and future projects, which will also be able to scan negatives. We will also need to purchase a license for Photoshop Elements to process the images. At this time, we would also wish to rehouse the photographs out of acidic photo albums and into archival sleeves. Our total equipment, software, and supplies are estimated at $340. SCRLC will provide the metadata and scanning training. Are the materials in the public domain? This collection of photographs was never published and therefore is not in the public domain, but Ann Brown's heirs signed a transfer of rights form when they donated the albums to the library. That was very smart of the library to get that transfer of rights form. So the library does have the rights to publish them online. Who is the intended audience? In our example, the collection would be of great interest to many members of the rural community, especially those living on or near properties where the farmhouses were located. We can also encourage local schools and colleges to use them in historical projects, and it would also be of interest to anyone researching rural architecture in this time period. And finally, how will you measure the project's success? And this is something that's very important to consider, especially if you're trying to get buy-in from your administrators or your board. So in this case, the project will be successful when all photographs have been described and made available in New York Heritage. We will contact SCRLC for online visitation statistics every three months to track the progress of the project. So now that you have your plan in place, you've secured your equipment and staff time to work on the project, what next? The first phase of the project should be describing the items you're digitizing. Here's a look at what's involved in the description, um, or also known as the cataloging process. Each digitized item will need a description at the item level. If the item has already been cataloged, the description will take less time for the catalog, uh, less time for the cataloger. So that's important to know, um, as we mentioned in selection of materials. Metadata can be collected in a spreadsheet, either an Excel or a Google Sheet, for upload into a digital asset management system, and I'll talk more about that later. And descriptive fields for best practices include title, creator, subject, physical format and description, date, digital format and date of digitization, holding institution and contact information, rights information, and technical data. So we have a metadata dictionary that we published for New York Heritage, which gives, explains each of the metadata fields that we require for New York Heritage and explains in detail um, how to, how to, what information needs to be put in those fields and how to format it. And even if you choose not to add your collection to New York Heritage, you can still use the metadata dictionary as a guide if you're not sure where to start with your metadata description. So it's a very important research resource and you can find it on the New York Heritage website. Or if you have difficult finding it, um, please email me and I'd be happy to send you a copy. So why do we have standardized metadata? It makes your item findable and it allows it to be retrieved with other objects on the web, especially when we use linked data. Some of the linked data and metadata descriptions we use in New York Heritage and New York State Historic Newspapers are Library of Congress subject headings, the source of graphic material subject headings, Library of Congress name authority files, Getty vocabularies, and more. Whenever we have the opportunity to use a controlled vocabulary, we do because it makes the information more findable. So after description comes the step of digital conversion. You'll want to select equipment appropriate for your collection. The most common equipment used are flatbed scanners. We use these for converting photographs, letters, documents, slides, negatives, postcards, pamphlets, and brochures, anything you can scan by lying flat. One thing to consider when using a flatbed scanner is if the material you're digitizing can be unbound. Sometimes organizations have multiple copies of yearbooks that they don't mind disbinding for digitization, or the original materials may have been bound together by the library or previous owner after publication. 
If the binding is not important to the history or storage of the physical materials, you may want to consider disbinding and boxing the item. For example, you might have a large volume of bound newspapers that can be scanned on an 11 by 17 flatbed scanner, but the margins are way too tight in the bound volume to get a good image on each page. Since the binding was imposed on the newspapers by the library after publication, you may wish to carefully disbind them to digitize, or have a conservator or bookbinder do it for you if you're not sure how, and then box them up for storage, keeping in mind that once the items are digitized, requests for the originals will be very infrequent. If you choose to do this, it's important to look at what added costs might be um, involved in the project. So if you're just finding these books, you'll also have to invest in storage boxes for the materials because they probably were not stored in boxes on the shelves. An eight and a half by 11 scanner will cost somewhere around $200 and an 11 by 17 scanner will be more in the $2,500 to $3,000 range. Minimal training is needed to use a flatbed scanner, so it's a great thing um, to have student or volunteer projects to have them work on scanning. So book scanners are best for bound books that can't be easily laid flat on a flatbed scanner and you don't want to unbind them. These are expensive, but you may be able to partner with a larger library in your region who owns one to digitize materials or outsource those items to a digitization vendor with one. Many universities and larger college libraries own book scanners for digitizing their collections. They can cost anywhere between $5,000 and $70,000. These scanners um, are a bit more complex to use, but are typically still easy enough for students and volunteers to learn to use. A copy stand and digital camera can be used for oversized items that won't fit on a large flatbed scanner like newspapers, or used in conjunction with book cradles to photograph items that can't be fully opened. There's a huge range of prices for digital cameras and copy stands with lighting, depending on the quality of the equipment purchased. You also need to make sure you have a dedicated space for this equipment, which also needs a lot of room. If you have a number of items in your collection needing the setup for digitization, it might be worth to invest in the equipment and training. But if you have a finite number of items needing the setup, you might want to consider partnering with another organization with a copy stand setup or outsourcing the digitization to a vendor. Photography training and experience is needed for this setup, so it requires a lot more training than the other two scanners. If you have unique audio or video tapes, it's best to outsource these items for digitization. They have a finite lifespan and need professional attention. Despite this, you may want to prioritize those items because the life expectancy for magnetic film is only 10 to 40 years, and once they've degraded badly enough, they can no longer be digitized and they're lost forever. So now let's look at some scanning guidelines. Um, do we want to scan in grayscale or color? If something is black and white, that may be obvious, but you may also wish to scan text in grayscale as well. Grayscale images will be much smaller files and take up less storage space than color images. Also, the bigger the resolution, the bigger the file, but you also want to make sure the resolution is high enough to capture all the information in the image. In New York Heritage, we have some minimum standards for resolution, which includes photographs at a min minimum of 600 dpi, or dots per inch, and text at 300 to 400 dpi. And for digital conversion, TIFF is the recommended file format for archival images because there is no lossy comp compression, and that means that there are no details of the image removed to save file space. And finally, it's good to have some good processing software on hand. For images, Photoshop, or a free Photoshop alternative um, like GIMP, is good for cropping and touching up images as needed. It's also great for converting files to different formats. You'll probably want to convert all those archival TIFF files you'll be creating to smaller compressed JPEGs um, for the images that you'll put up online, which I'll talk about in a minute. Adobe Pro or other PDF software is great for creating PDF files from your archival images. And Abbey Fine Reader is a program that makes text, machine-readable text, using optical character recognition. You can find heavy discounts for the Adobe software for nonprofit organizations at TechSoup.org. And SCRLC has an institutional license for Abbey if you can't afford one at your organization. So the software should not be off limits to you. 
So here's the final step in the digitization process, putting your image up online. For New York Heritage, we create a smaller access image for uploading. This access image can also be called a derivative image. For single images, we would create a JPEG file, which compresses the information in the TIFF image and makes the file size much smaller and quicker to open for online users. It's also at a lower quality, good enough for a PowerPoint presentation or sharing on social media, but not good enough for commercial use, like printing or publication. We do this to encourage people to contact your organization for commercial use of your images, even if they're in the public domain. For documents, we would create a PDF file, which would also include the encoded text from any OCR processing or text from any transcription. For New York Heritage, we use ContentDM, an OCLC product, as a digital asset management system. Contributors have the option of downloading and learning to use ContentDM for uploading the images into New York Heritage or sending the images and a metadata spreadsheet to us and having SCRLC do the upload for them. Learning to use ContentDM gives greater control over your online collections, but whether or not you wish to learn to use ContentDM may depend on whether you have an information professional on staff, if you have students and volunteers doing the bulk of the work on the project, or if staff time or technology skills are limited. For New York State historic news newspapers, the process is a little bit less involved because we only need one description for each newspaper, and they are usually cataloged by the Library of Congress. If no mark record exists for the newspaper, you can contact us at SCRLC, and I can catalog the newspaper for you and upload the record to OCLC. So for the process in New York State historic newspapers, um, you have the files named in a specific format, and sent to the Northern New York Library Network, which is another one of our um, ESLN councils, um, with the MARC record. The Northern New York Library Network does all the uploading into their own digital asset management system, which is called Cronum. And then the newspapers are published by them to the web. So I've already mentioned New York Heritage and New York State Historic Newspapers a bunch, but I wanted to quickly go over what these websites are. SCRLC members uh, may have, oh, so New York Heritage, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> New York Heritage is a research portal for students, educators, historians, genealogists, and anyone interested in New York State history. It includes items from over 260 organizations and has over 670 distinct collections. And materials in New York Heritage include photographs, letters, documents, diaries, maps, books, manuscripts, artwork, postcards, posters, oral histories, yearbooks, and more. Um, so oral histories can be contributed in either audio or video format, depending on how you choose to collect them. And yearbooks tend to be our most popular items in New York Heritage. People love looking at old yearbooks. So if you have them in your collection, even though they're kind of on the time-consuming end uh, of a digital project, you might want to strongly consider uh, um, prioritizing those as a project in order to get engaged with your community. So items added to New York Heritage are also added to the Digital Public Library of America, um, which you can find at dp.la. And that DPLA is a content aggregator for the many digital repositories for cultural heritage materials across the U.S. And when I say it's a content aggregator, it means that the original items are not hosted in DPLA. What they do is they take the metadata from the item, so all that description, um, that you spend all that time using to catalog the item goes into DPLA with a thumbnail of the image. And when people click on the thumbnail, it actually takes them back to the original image in New York Heritage or whatever repository it lives in. In that way, um, all traffic is still being recorded on that image and not on the DPLA website. So you can still get accurate um, website statistics. And SCRLC members may have their collections hosted in these repositories for free, and they can be used as your primary interface to your digital collections or as an additional interface. For example, larger libraries like Binghamton University um, host their collections on their own website, but they also add their collections to New York Heritage and DPLA for broader access to their collections. Most of our smaller organizations, such as our historical organizations, public libraries, and small academic libraries, use New York Heritage as their primary interface for their digital collections and link to their New York Heritage landing page on their websites. So 
Here is a screenshot of the front page of New York Heritage. There are many different ways to search and browse the collection. There's an advanced search, a general search, and there's also faceted searching by type and date. Um, and you can also uh, browse by the collections held at a particular organization. There's also an education tab, which you can kind of see up there in the middle, that provides resources for educators to use the primary source materials and New York Heritage um, as part of the Social Studies Common Core curriculum. So we do a lot in order to make the content accessible and usable. Here's an example of um, one of our members' landing pages. Um, so we'll soon be launching a new version of our website, and so I'm going to give you a sneak peek of what that's going to look like. So this is a snippet from our new website, and it's a landing page. Um, and the new website will soon be in beta. It's going to be mobile responsive and feature search and browse functionality at the collection level as well as at the item level. So cur the current website, you can only search at the item level, not at the collection level. We're using Drupal to build onto the current web display um, provided by ContentDM. And right now we're using the web display that's provided by ContentDM. This is something we're building on top of that display. So New York State Historic Newspapers provides free online access to a wide range of newspapers that reflects New York's unique history. All the newspapers are run through OCR software so that they are all text searchable. And there are newspapers from each county in New York State with more added every day. So the Northern New York Library Network is constantly adding new newspapers. So the, the repository just keeps growing and growing. So here's a screenshot from the front page of New York State Historic Newspapers. Um, as you can see, the newspapers here are organized by county and not by contributor um, because users are more apt to search newspaper by location. But you'd be surprised what you can find in this repository. This is a screenshot from the Ogdensburg Journal from February of 1987. Some second graders were having a snow sculpture day, meaning that they got to spend all day outside building snow sculptures instead of going to class. And if you have really good eyesight for reading tiny print, you'll see that the little girl on the top right is me. And I had completely forgotten about this day until I saw this photograph last year after randomly searching my name in the repository. So you never know what you'll find. And as you can see, um, this sort of functionality makes New York State historic newspapers especially popular for people doing genealogical research. So you may be thinking, this is great, I want to do it, but how will I pay for it? So the first step is usually selling the idea of digitization to your administrators or board. Once you can get them to agree that digitization is necessary for your organization or library, it's easier to work digitization efforts into budgets and planning documents. Focusing on the benefits of digitization to your community, and there are many that we've discussed, can help make your argument for you. You might also want to approach them with the project plan for a pilot digitization project. Some administrators are more comfortable approving digitization projects when they have projected staff time and costs in front of them, as opposed to an open-ended request. I talked a little about community partnerships earlier, but involving your patrons with your efforts can help save you time and money on projects and get community buy-in. Patrons can help you identify collections to be digitized, help identify mystery photographs and items. They can also be involved in transcription projects. Handwritten letters, diaries, and documents need transcription to be fully accessible online, and often community members are eager to help. You can approach local colleges and schools who might want to have their class participate in a transcription project so that they have a better understanding of historical documents and cursive writing. Many schools and colleges also have community service or internship requirements, and students typically enjoy working on digitization projects. Many libraries and historical organizations are also creating scan days for their communities, where people can come in and scan their personal historical letters, photographs, and documents, and add them to your library or organization's digital collection, while keeping their originals and some digital copies for themselves. It's a great way to engage the community, provide a valuable service for them with your scanning equipment, and add to your digital collections and the historical record all at the same time. It's truly a benefit to everyone involved in community digitization. 
And you can also seek grant funding for digitization. The National Endowment for the Humanities has funded digitization projects in the past, as well as the Library Services and Technology Act, but these federally funded programs may not be viable sources of funding in the near future due to projected budget cuts. SCRLC offers $20,000 total in funding for our members each year that can be used for digitization projects. Applications for SCRLC grants are typically released in December and due in February, and you can find more information about our grants at scrlc.org backslash grant dash information. So SCRLC can also help defray the costs associated with digitization so that efforts can be sustainable to some degree without outside funding. All services are included in your SCRLC membership at no additional cost. And these services are consultation and planning, so we can help evaluate your collections for digitization, assist in digitization project planning, and also help workflows for your staff. We provide training um, for how to digitize your collections using digitization best practices and standards. We provide recommended technical specifications, and we help set up and use scanning equipment. We also provide training in cataloging and metadata and the use of various software used in the management of digital assets, which we cater to our members' individual technical needs. And if you're unable to afford the purchase of a flatbed scanner, we have two scanners at SRLC that we can lend to our members to use for digitization projects. We provide the license to OCLC's Content DM, which costs about $35.50 a year with additional fees for server space if you were to purchase it on your own, and we provide that at no cost. We also provide OCR services using Abbey Fine Reader if you cannot afford um, OCR software. Um, hosting collections in New York Heritage, DPLA, and New York State Historic Newspapers is provided at no cost or additional fees. We also actively promote exploration of digital collections via social media, blog posts, and online exhibitions. And I just talked about this, but um, an SCRLC grant is a great way to get moving on a digitization project that your organization doesn't have the financial resources to fund. Any information technology project that will help share and improve access to your resources regionally may qualify for funding. And so if you're a public library, you may be confused on whether or not you're a member of SCRLC since uh, the Finger Lakes Library System, the Southern Tier Library System, and the Four County Library System are all SCRLC system members. We do require that individual public libraries join SCRLC directly as affiliate members to use our digitization services directly, um, but the affiliate membership for them is highly discounted. So that cost is $250 for the first year and $125 for each year thereafter. If that membership fee is still too much for your library to afford, because we understand some libraries really are on shoestring budgets, you can still use our services indirectly, but you would need to partner with your library system to do so. So for example, if you're a member of the Southern Tier Library System, someone at STLS would need to be the project manager to work with SCRLC, and items would need to be added to the Southern Tier Library System's digital collections page in New York Heritage, instead of having your own digital collection page. Um, also, if you're participating indirectly, you would not be able to apply for grant funding from us, but you could apply if you partner with your system. So I know that's a little confusing. So that doesn't mean you're not eligible for SCRL, SCRLC grants. It just means instead of applying directly, you have to apply through the Southern Tier Library System if you don't join us directly. And if anyone has any questions about um, memberships or are not currently an SCROC member, um, please email me and I'm happy to answer any questions about that. So now we're at questions and we can, we can open that up if anyone has any. Yeah, if you have questions, just go ahead and type them into the question box over there on your command module or into the chat box. So we'll give people a minute to pose their questions. Yeah. So just to go a little bit further on um, membership, so even if you're not a member of a library system, I know some of our historical societies are also running on a shoestring budget, and even $125 a year or the $250 startup, that, even that's out of reach for them, and they don't have a library system that they can go back to and depend on. Um, I would still ur 
urge them to contact us and see if we can't work something out. If they can demonstrate a large financial need like that, we don't want to turn anyone away. The whole point of New York Heritage and New York uh, State Historic Newspapers is to make all this content accessible to the general public, and that is our main goal. And we don't want to exclude anyone because of lack of funding. So um, if you are in any doubt or anything questionable, please just email me and we'll work something out. So any questions for Julia? All right, Sorry. I'm not seeing any, but any questions. I guess you answered them all, Julia. Okay. <laughs> like I said, my email's up there. I, please email me at any time or give me a call. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about digitization. Okay, and we'll be sending out the link to this recording within the week. And thank you, Julia, and thanks everyone for joining oh, us. One more thing I forgot to mention, sorry. Um, so one thing I did not include in today's presentation, um, I did not include marketing strategies for digital collections just because of um, time constraints. If you are interested in a short webinar on marketing your digital collections in the future, please email Jessica and let her know, and that's something that we can have set up at SCRLC. Yep, absolutely. All right, have a great day, everyone.